Welcome to Full Spectrum Science. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman, and today we're going to talk about making color. And there are many, many ways to make color. We're just going to talk about the more common ways to make color. But before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about waves in general. And we need to get some of the, the jargon under our belt. So let's start a little bit. What are the qualities of light waves? Well, the first thing we can talk about is the speed of light. Light is an electromagnetic wave a wave of changing electric and magnetic fields that travels through space at nature's speed limit, 186,282 miles per second, or about 300,000 kilometers per second. Nothing in nature moves faster. Galileo first attempted to measure the speed of light. He did this by measuring the distance between two hilltops. Galileo sent his assistant to the far hilltop with a shuttered lantern. Galileo stood on the nearer hilltop with an identical lantern. The plan was for Galileo to open the shutter of his lantern and then for his assistant to open the shutter of his lamp as soon as he saw the light from Galileo's, using his pulse for timing. There were no clocks yet. Galileo planned to measure the time the light took to travel back and forth between the two hills. If he knew the time and the distance, he could figure out the speed of light. He had no idea how fast light traveled or that his experiment was really doomed to failure, but only because he really lacked the technology. Galileo concluded that if not instantaneous, it is extraordinarily rapid. And that is a valid scientific statement. Galileo failed because the speed of light is so unbelievably fast. Consider for a moment that light can travel around the Earth more than seven times in one second. What you see here is a proper scale model of the Earth-Moon system. Both Earth and moon are properly sized, and they're the correct distance from one another. It took the Apollo astronauts three whole days to reach the moon in their tiny capsule. It takes light about 1.3 seconds to cover the same distance. Did you get that? Let me do it again. 1.3 seconds. Light takes only eight minutes to cover the distance between the sun and the Earth. Here, you see an amazing high-tech movie of a pulse of laser light moving through a slightly milky water solution in a plastic bottle. Note that this normally takes less than a billionth of a second to happen, and that the pulse of laser light is less than a tenth of a billionth of a second long. Light takes about a billionth of a second, a nanosecond, to travel one foot. This is really a composite movie of many pulses of laser light. They send a pulse, wait for a short time, and take a photo. They send another pulse, wait a little bit longer, and take another photo. They continue to send pulses, increasing the wait time and taking more photos. Then, the photos are assembled into a movie, which is what you're watching right now. Incredible. Another jargon word we need to understand is frequency. The frequency is simply the number of wiggles per second. Anything that's vibrating, you can measure the number of wiggles per second, and the unit of frequency is called the Hertz, abbreviated HZ, named after Heinrich Hertz, who discovered radio waves. If something is vibrating at 10 Hertz, it's vibrating 10 times per second. The left dot you see here has a lower frequency, the middle dot a medium frequency, and the right dot has a higher frequency. You may be familiar with Hertz if you're old enough to have listened to your music on one of these. Kids, this is called a radio. If you look at the right end of the scale, you'll see that AM radio is measured in kilohertz, or 
thousands of vibrations per second. And FM is measured in megahertz, or millions of vibrations per second. Here, we're talking about the frequency of the radio wave that's carrying the musical information. If the wave vibrates slowly, the peaks and troughs of the wave are further apart. Vibrating quickly brings the peaks and troughs closer together. If you measure the distance from peak to peak, or trough to trough, you get a distance called the wavelength. Here, you see the red wave has twice the wavelength of the violet wave. If we played these two waves on a piano, the red wave might sound like this. And the violet wave would sound like this, an octave apart. As a matter of fact, red and violet light wavelengths and frequencies are about an octave apart. We can see about an octave of light. All light waves travel at the same speed, the speed of light. That means that slower vibrating light, red, produces long wavelength waves, and faster vibrating light, blue and violet, produces shorter wavelength waves. There is a simple, direct, and proportional relationship between the frequency and the wavelength. Long wave visible light is red. As you shorten the wavelength, you'll proceed through the visible spectrum from red to orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and finally violet. The easy way to remember the colors in order is to remember the name, Roy G. Biv. I'm sure you've heard that before. It's an acronym for the colors. And of course, indigo is just thrown in there because we needed a vowel, otherwise it would be Roy G. Biv. Just because our human perception only covers red to violet, that doesn't mean that other species perceive the same thing. Birds have a somewhat wider range, and dogs substantially less range. We may only see one octave, but the piano is very large. Below the red frequencies, we find infrared. When these hit you, the electromagnetic wave can cause molecules in your skin to start vibrating faster, and you feel the effect as heat. Below the infrared are microwaves. Your Wi-Fi and Bluetooth use microwaves for communication. Radar is just microwaves. And, of course, your microwave oven uses microwaves to get your food molecules moving, meaning hotter. Lastly, on the low end, we have radio waves, vibrating thousands and millions of times per second, with wavelengths from less than a meter to kilometers long. Above our tiny octave of visible light, we have ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma rays, all of which are invisible to the human eye as well. This tremendous set of frequencies is called the electromagnetic spectrum. Our eyes have evolved to use the frequencies most available from the sun, which is visible light. If you picture the entire frequency range from radio to gamma rays as the notes on a piano, visible light would take up slightly less than an octave, as I've mentioned before. However, the electromagnetic piano would not have the normal eight octaves of its musical counterpart, but a mind-boggling 80 octaves. This keyboard would be 42 feet long, with the visible light octave near octave 52. This would be a truly grand piano. By the way, this is a shot from a movie of my childhood, The 5,000 Fingers of Dr. T, and was the only movie written by Theodore Geisel, Dr. Seuss. It's a very surrealistic movie, and I highly recommend it. Oh, hey, where did that come from? Hmm. Wow. Okay, now that we've got the jargon under our belts, let's talk about making light. The first way is to excite atoms of a gas. When the atoms de-excite, they give off light. Here, you see three examples. A low-pressure sodium lamp, which gives off a very pure yellow light. A neon sign, which, by the way, only the red is actually neon. 
The rest of the colors are made with mercury. And finally, a mercury germicidal lamp with its beautiful baby blue color. Let's look at the making of light at the atomic level. This is a very simplistic model of the atom. The nucleus in the middle contains protons and neutrons, and the electrons surround the nucleus in shells. The energy levels of these shells are determined by the laws of quantum mechanics, which we are not going to cover. Electrons can only be in these specific shells or energy levels. Like walking up a set of stairs, you can only stand on the stairs, not between them. Moving an electron from an inner shell to an outer shell requires you to put in energy. When electrons surrounding atoms are excited, they jump from a lower energy inner orbit to a higher energy outer orbit. The excitation energy comes from an electric current jostling the atoms, or it can come from an incoming light energy being absorbed. Let's use electricity to excite this atom. Most of the time, the electrons immediately jump back, giving up the energy they gained as light. This is what you see in a neon sign or a fluorescent lamp. The bigger the difference in energy levels, the more bluer the light given off. Again, this is a highly simplified atom with only four energy levels. There are many, many more energy levels. But here, you can see there are many possible jumps depending on how the atom is excited. You may get a high energy violet jump, or a low energy red jump, or anywhere in between. Atoms can each give off a whole variety of colors depending on the quantum mechanical arrangement of the energy jumps. Let's look at some of these in real excited gases. We need a tool to help us separate out the colors. Have you ever looked through a pair of these rainbow glasses? Let me put this one on. They make everything look like this. Well, the clear parts you look through are made of a material called diffraction grating. Here is a highly magnified photo uh, taken with an electron microscope of the diffraction grating. The plastic lenses have these lines scored on them. Those lines break up the light into their colors, showing the spectrum of the source. Like this, you see a spectrum on either side of the original source. You may have seen this in a CD or a DVD. Their surfaces also have a series of lines etched into them that hold the musical or video information. Those lines also break the light into its colors. Let's look at some glowing gases and see their spectra. We are going to demonstrate glowing gases now. We've lowered the lights in the studio, which is why it looks so dark here, and we put a set of diffraction grating glasses over the camera lens so that it can see the rainbow colors from our tubes. The tubes are glass tubes and inside of these glass tubes are gases at a very low pressure. Well, let me show you some of the inside parts of the tubes here. I think you can see better on this one right here. There's an electrode inside the tube right here connected to an external contact. And on the other side, there's an electrode inside the tube also connected to an external contact. I'm going to take those two external contacts and put them into the high voltage power supply. And this is where we'll supply it with electricity to cause it to glow. This tube contains the simplest gas known. You know which one that is? You're right if you said hydrogen. Let me load it up here in the high voltage power supply. And I'm going to turn it on. And cameras have a hard time seeing the colors. It's uh, too bright. If we defocus the camera, we'll be able to see the color of the tube. There it is, that beautiful hydrogen crimson color. So let's look at the spectrum now. Now the diffraction grating on the lens there is going to break apart the light. But to find that, it's off to the side a little bit. So we're going to pan off to the side here. And we're going to see the colors that come from hydrogen. And here you can see that hydrogen gives off a beautiful red called hydrogen alpha, kind of a cyan color called hydrogen beta, and a beautiful violet color, hydrogen gamma. 
three first letters of the Greek alphabet. So this is a very simple spectrum, very simple spectrum from the uh, simplest gas. Now I'd like to show you a few other gases as well. So let's do that. Let's turn this off and I'm going to go to helium gas now. So I'm going to remove this tube and I have an identical looking tube that has helium gas in it. Let's put that in here and let's see what it looks like. This one we actually, if we unfocus, you see it's still it's kind of white, a little bit yellowish, and we'll see why when we look at the spectrum. Oh, it is different. Look at that. Here we have another red color, beautiful bright yellow color, a couple cyans, some blues, and, a, and another violet color here. This is a very different pattern than you saw with the hydrogen. Remember that these are going to be different. We're going to go back and see this yellow color in, uh, uh, in uh, another spectrum later on. Remember that yellow color. Okay, want to see another one? Because I have a couple more. I know you do. Let's take the helium out. And this one's a slight, the next gas up in the, in the column of the noble gases and periodic table. This is neon. Again, notice these colors, these tubes are, they are totally clear. You can't see, there's no color in the gas itself. That comes from when it glows. And neon looks like this, except again, the camera's not quite catching the, it's really bright, and neon is actually this bright orange, orange color. It's just gorgeous. So let's go look at its spectrum now. Very complicated. Look at all the colors there. Very rich in the reds and the oranges and the yellows. But notice, very few greens and blues, which is why when you pivot back to the tube over here, you'll see that it's actually very orange in color. Neon is just orange. If you see a neon sign, only that orange color is really neon. One more? We have one more that's kind of important, so let's take a look at it. Neon's very bright. Let's go to this one here. This is an atom that's a very complicated atom, but it doesn't have a very complicated spectrum in the visible part. This is mercury. Actually, that's pretty good right there, but let's defocus it a little bit and you'll see that it's kind of a baby blue color. Um, it's not as bright as some of the other uh, tubes are, but it's just a beautiful uh, color. Let's take a look at its spectrum. There we go. So here we can have a kind of a dim yellow, and then there's a kind of a greenish color right here, and then a very bright violet. You can't see it, but there's a lot of ultraviolet happening out here as well. As a matter of fact, there's probably more ultraviolet light being made by this tube than there is visible, visible light. So let's go back and uh, we'll turn this off and let's get back to our other slides. Here's a review of what we just saw. Notice that every atom has a unique signature or spectrum. Look at a glowing element's light and you can identify it. This makes it one of the most valuable tools in science, being used across almost all disciplines. It's especially useful in astronomy. We can't just go out and get a sample of a star or a nebula and then analyze it in the lab. The only thing we have is the light that arrives here on Earth from those very distant objects. The colors of the spectrum, like from the great nebula in Orion seen here, can tell us the composition of those heavenly objects. By looking for the Doppler effect in the spectrum, we can determine how fast objects are moving and rotating, allowing us to find stellar motions and even exoplanets like you see here. The spectrum tells us about temperatures, densities, and pressures. This is the Crab Nebula in Taurus, the result of a supernova explosion that occurred in 1054 AD. We can learn about magnetic fields around stars, nebulae, and galaxies. Here, we see a visualization of the magnetic fields in the Whirlpool galaxy. It's like sprinkling iron filings over an entire galaxy. Absorption of specific colors, like you see here in the Horsehead Nebula, can tell us something about the interstellar clouds and dust. Spectroscopy is very powerful. Here, you see a video loop of excited hydrogen gas erupting from the surface of the sun, following magnetic field lines and glowing against the dark sky. 
This is called a solar prominence. The Earth is in the lower corner just for size comparison. That previous photo just showed the red color given off by hydrogen. Remember the beautiful crimson color of hydrogen gas you saw in the gas discharge tube? Solar prominences glow in the same hydrogen colors. Here you see them glowing during a total solar eclipse. If you put your diffraction grating glasses in front of your camera lens during an eclipse, you'd capture the spectrum of the sun's outer atmosphere called the chromosphere. You're familiar with some of those colors because you've already seen them glow from our demo. Note the bright yellow helium color. Helium was discovered on the sun before it was discovered on Earth. That's why we call it helium after Helios, the sun god. If you introduce chemical salts into a flame, the elemental atoms become excited and show their colors. In chemistry, this is called a flame test. In the art piece, Below the Flames, created by Exploratorium artist Earl Sterling, you see a large pan with sand and various chemical salts with gas coming in from below. Absolutely incredibly beautiful. Like my gas discharge tubes, lightning produces gas excitation. This photo is from Kitt Peak Observatory near Tucson, Arizona. If you take a photo of lightning with your diffraction grating glasses over the lens, you'll get the spectrum of the gases in the lightning stroke. Let's magnify in on this portion. Here, you see the colors produced by gases in the atmosphere. You see nitrogen, which is close to 80% of our air, and hydrogen. Now, hydrogen gas is not part of our atmosphere, but the lightning is so energetic that it rips apart water molecules, H2O, into its component gases, hydrogen and oxygen. Only a few of the spectral lines are labeled here. Moving up a bit higher in the atmosphere, we see the glowing gases of the aurora. The sun continuously exhales charged particles called the solar wind. The Earth's magnetic field deflects these particles into the north and south polar regions when the solar wind crashes into the atmosphere, it excites the atoms, causing them to give off light. Astronauts on board the International Space Station get to see the aurora from the other side, above. Here is a time-lapse movie taken as the ISS orbits over the polar regions at night. What an amazing sight. Like lightning, you can look at the spectra of aurora and analyze their atmospheric gases, which not unexpectedly include nitrogen and oxygen. Now let's look at a different, though similar way that light is made, incandescence. So far, the atomic excitation we've discussed happens in rarefied gases. The gas in my discharge tubes, the gas in cosmic nebulae, the sun's outer atmosphere and the Earth's outer atmosphere have all been gas at a very low pressure, where the atoms are far apart. What happens when atoms are close together? Let's do some demos, and we'll come back to this slide in a bit. In my gas discharge tubes, the gas was at a very low pressure, which meant the molecules were far apart. So, like these bells that I have right here, when they're far apart, and when you excite them and de-excite them, they ring with very pure frequencies or colors. If I hold them together, they kind of interfere with each other if they're together. And listen now. So not quite as pure a ringing sound. What happens if I have a whole bunch of atoms all crowded together like the filament, the solid filament, of this tungsten lamp right here. Let's do that, except now we're gonna use an entire box of bells like you see right here. And when I shake these, what does it sound like? Kinda of sounds like white noise, all frequencies together. And the equivalent in light of white noise would be white light. Let's take a look at what that looks like.
Okay, we have dimmed the lights in the studio again to give you a better view of the spectrum. So let me turn on the incandescent light here and we'll pan over and take a look at the spectrum. There it is, look at that. There you see the entire visible spectrum almost, from red to orange to yellow to green to blue to indigo and finally violet. These horizontal stripes you see are actually the supports of the filament casting a shadow. Those, that's just an artifact. If I run my finger in front of the lamp, you'll see that my finger also creates a horizontal line in the spectrum. In this slide, you see several examples of incandescence. The sun, we mentioned before, the chromosphere, the outer atmosphere, puts out separate individual lines. But deeper down in the sun, where the atoms are crushed together, there you get an incandescent spectrum. So the sun puts out both a bright line spectrum and an incandescent spectrum. The candle flame is bright yellow because there are carbon particles in the candle flame. Those bright particles of carbon are heated in the flame and since the particles are close together, it's a solid carbon particles, it's glowing in incandescence. The carbon arc lamp you see at the top there is just like the candle, except rather than burning a fuel, electricity is heating up the carbon particles in an electric arc. And in a tungsten lamp, as we saw in the demo, we're exciting the filament, solid filament, of a lamp using electricity. And so that also gives off a continuous spectrum. Let's talk about another light-making phenomenon, fluorescence. In fluorescence, an energetic incoming ultraviolet photon can give the electron enough energy to jump up several energy levels at once. As the electron de-excites, it can fall back through smaller energy steps, giving off less energetic light. For instance, the first jump might give off an infrared photon, and the second jump would give up maybe a green photon. From our point of view, since we can't see the infrared photon, it looks like the ultraviolet, also invisible to us, has been turned into green light. This is called fluorescence. The old style tube televisions worked by fluorescence. Here's a cross section of the tube called a cathode ray tube. An electron beam was focused and deflected by coils, striking the phosphor-coated screen on the right. This caused the phosphors to glow or fluoresce. In color televisions, three phosphors, red, green, and blue, were coated on the face of the screen. The arrangements of the colored phosphors differed depending on the brand of TV. By hitting on the right combinations, you could build up a picture with any color. Here are phosphors glowing under ultraviolet light. Let's do some demos with fluorescent materials. All right, we have dimmed the studio lights again because some of these things are a little hard to see with a lot of bright light on it. So let's start off with some fluorescent pastels. I have here some fluorescent pastels. There are lots of different colors as you can see. I'm gonna get my ultraviolet flashlight. This puts out some pretty bright ultraviolet light. And this time I'm gonna shine on the pastels and the pastels will take the ultraviolet light and turn them into visible white light quite bright here, as you can see. Another thing I discovered that was fluorescent, I was shopping at Costco one day and I picked up a bundle of these microfiber cloths, these yellow microfiber cloths, and I discovered that these were super bright fluorescent too, turning the ultraviolet into bright yellow and greenish light. Pretty cool. Another thing that's really cool that's fluorescent is tonic water. The quinine in tonic water is fluorescent. And if I shine the ultraviolet flashlight on it, it glows a beautiful bluish color. If I move the flashlight around, you can see the beam of the flashlight inside the bottle. Some manufacturers put fluorescent dyes into their plastics. This particular piece of plastic is designed for atomic nuclear experiments that when particles go through this, it gives off a flash of light and the fluorescent dye in here enhances that flash of light. If I put my flashlight on that, you can see it glows a beautiful bright, bright green color. This is kind of nice. If you use laundry detergent, this happens to be all. 
Um, all laundry detergents, though, have a fluorescent dye in them. If I look at that, you can see the laundry detergent down here. Can't tilt it too far over for you. But if I shine my ultraviolet light, you'll see it converts the ultraviolet into bright, bright blue. If you wash your tidy whities in this detergent, the fluorescent agent is going to stain your underwear. And when you walk outside, now I'm not suggesting you walk outside in your underwear, but if you do, the bright white sunlight will reflect off the white of your, your tidy whities And that's bright, but it will also turn the ultraviolet light in the sunlight into this bright blue. And so your laundry will not just be white, it will be whiter than white. That's the marketing part of it. The last thing I want to show you is a fluorescent light. We've all pretty much seen these tubes that uh, can be in, this one would be in a desk lamp, a larger tube might be in a light fixture above your head. These tubes have inside of them mercury vapor. Remember the mercury vapor we saw in the gas discharge tube? Well, this gives off that same baby blue color. As a matter of fact, I have a specialized tube here to show you. This is a fluorescent tube, except the bottom part of the tube here is clear, and the top part of the tube has that white powder on the inside of it that's common in all fluorescent tubes. If I pass electricity through it, it will glow, and you may recognize the glow in the bottom part of the tube, the same baby blue glow you saw in the mercury discharge tube. Above, it looks white because inside this tube, the mercury vapor glowing is giving off a bright, bright ultraviolet in addition to the visible light. And we can flip our diffraction grating down over the lens and look at the spectrum of this lamp. Let's pivot to the side, let's pan to the side and look at the spectrum here. Look at that. The bottom of the lamp, which is where the, uh, the just open mercury tube, the clear mercury tube, you see the mercury spectrum. The dim yellow, the bright green, and the bright violet. Remember that? On the top of the tube up here, you can see the spectrum of mercury, but you can also see the spectrum of the glowing powder that's been fluoresced by the bright ultraviolet inside the tube to create this bright phosphor glow. Isn't that cool? Right next to me, I have a compact fluorescent tube right here. Let me just turn it on. There we go. And it looks pretty bright white right there, doesn't it? And we can move over and look at the spectrum of this as well. This is going to look a little different because this has a different set of phosphors in it. Here, there's no clear area, so you don't see the entire mercury spectrum. You still notice it's made up of fluorescent tubes too, by the way. Um, you see the bright violet, you see the bright green, you see a little bit of that dim yellow, but there's other colors in there too. Since this is a warm white compact fluorescent, they have red glowing phosphors in this mixture as well. So let's get back to our other slides. The next light making phenomenon we'll explore today is phosphorescence. Here you see the Exploratorium's famous glowing shadow box. Phosphorescence is very similar to fluorescence, but with one important difference. Phosphorescent material hangs on to the energy given to it and only slowly releases it as a glow. This is the familiar glow-in-the-dark material we all know and love. It starts the same way as fluorescence. An energetic incoming ultraviolet photon can give the electron enough energy to jump up several energy levels. Think of it this way. We have a hill, the elevated energy of the atom. If we put a ball at the top of a hill in the excited state, it immediately rolls down the hill. When you excite most atoms, they immediately de-excite, giving up their gained energy. They are not stable when excited. In phosphorescence, the hill looks more like this. Drop a ball on the top of this hill and the ball will stay there. The ball needs a little external disturbance to roll down the hill and lose its energy. In the atom, once dislodged, the excited electron falls to its lower energy state with an accompanying pulse of light. 
This external disturbance could be a bump from a nearby atom or a neighboring pulse of light passing nearby. The bump or disturbing light pulse stimulates the excited atom to emit its light as a light pulse. This is called stimulated emission. Let's look at some phosphorescent materials. Okay, we're going to dim the lights again, and actually for this demonstration of phosphorescence, which is a much more subtle effect, we're gonna to have to really dim the lights, so you're only gonna see me in silhouette later on. The first thing I wanna show you is that shadow box material. Our shadow box material is really just a vinyl, a flexible vinyl with phosphorescent powder that's actually been impregnated into it, and I have a bottle of that powder right here. I can uh, shine ultraviolet light on that and you can see that after I expose it, it glows in a beautiful color. Look, sort of looks like uh, radioactive, but it's not radioactive. So what I can do here with the phosphorescent sheet, I can put my hand in front of it and this is what happens in our shadow box. And if I expose it to ultraviolet light, my hand is casting a shadow and I'm, then I'm gonna take my hand away and you'll see the shadow of my hand left behind, kind of like Peter Pan. If I use a laser on it, I can actually draw on the material itself. There we go, look at that, I can actually draw. Isn't that kind of cool? I also have some phosphorescent material here that has a different phosphorescent dye in it. So this phosphorescent dye actually glows in a cyan color, but this is much more subtle than the uh, green color that you saw before. As a matter of fact, I have a bunch of different phosphorescent dyes right here. Let me just charge them up and you can see that these all glow different colors. We have a white one there at the bottom, a dark blue one, a sky blue one, a white phosphor, and then the green one that we've become used to so far. Different color phosphors. There's even red ones, but they're really inefficient. You would never see those with the camera. I can even get phosphorescent powder that's been incorporated into these little stones that you can put into your garden at night, and then the sun will charge them up during the day and they will glow at night. Isn't that cool? And the last thing that has this fluorescent powder in it that I really, really like, you can get actual fluorescent formica. This is things that you might have put on your kitchen counters back in the 60s and 70s. But think about this. You can buy this Lumifos Formica and do your entire kitchen in glow-in-the-dark material. When you go for that midnight snack, you won't have to turn on the lights anymore. Isn't that fun? One last interesting way to make color is with a new technology, quantum dots. In these vials is a liquid with very small manufactured particles. They interact with incoming blue or ultraviolet light to convert invisible high energy photons to lower energy visible photons. The bigger the particle, the redder the light. The particles in these bottles are all the same substance chemically. They only differ in particle size. This means the colors they glow in can be precisely controlled in the manufacturing process. Let me show you some actual quantum dots, and I'd like to thank Nanosys for giving these quantum dots to me. We've only had to dim the lights a little bit for this demonstration, and I have four vials of quantum dots right here, and I can show those to you. Let me light them up here. With an ultraviolet light, they glow. Depending on the size of the dot, they'll glow either red for the bigger dots, the six nanometer dots, or yellow or greenish or even kind of a little deeper green, closer to the blue. I only have four colors of quantum dots here. Isn't that cool? Quantum mechanics that you can see. Here you can see the color curves for different sized quantum dots. Note that the dots are very small from two to six nanometers, billionths of a meter in diameter. You can imagine the difficulties in manufacturing these. They're beginning to use quantum dots in flat panel TVs behind the LCD as a source of light that matches the colored filters in front of the panel. This makes for brighter and more saturated colors.
And that is all we have time for today in this episode of Full Spectrum Science. This has been Full Spectrum Science with Ron Hipschman, brought to you by the Exploratorium in San Francisco. This program, like all Exploratorium programs, is only possible because of donors like you. We know that this time is challenging, but if you can, help us keep educational content like this free and accessible to all by donating today at www.exploratorium.edu connect. Thank you.